Thanks for tuning in to the World XP Podcast. If you're enjoying the content, please drop us up, drop a like, and let us know your thoughts below in the comments. Also, please consider supporting our podcast via the link below. It really helps us out. Ian, welcome to the World XP Podcast, bro. Happy to have you. How you doing? How's it going, man? It's good to see you. Thanks, thanks yeah. for having me on here. Yeah, of course. So uh, for those that don't know, Ian and I go probably a little ways back um, from soccer specifically. And we were chatting the other day about... I don't know, random stuff. Oh, how's the job going? This and that. He's like, oh yeah, I'm bringing these people over and I do some stuff for sports, like diplomacy. And I was in my head, I said, that would be an interesting um, podcast topic. State department. Thanks for giving the thumbs up. We appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. But why don't you go ahead and do some in like what it is you do and kind of a general overview of the program? Because I don't think I had no clue this existed. It took uh, 10 minutes of explanation from you for me to even understand why this exists, where it exists, instead of just some, like, ah, fuck it, some make-a-wish program or something crazy like that, yeah. uh, instead of being where it is. So, fire away. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so, as you said, my name's Ian Evans. Um, I work with an organization called FHI 360, which is a large international nonprofit organization. Um, they kind of focus in all different areas of development. Uh, they typically do public health, uh, education, kind of you name it in international development, they do it. Um, but my team in particular uh, is the sports, cultural and youth team. I serve as a, a program officer on the team. And um, yeah, our team, our main client is the Department of State uh, Sports Diplomacy Division. Uh, and we're the implementing partner for the sports visitor and sports envoy programs. So I'll give like a, a brief description of each and then we can kind of go from there. But yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, the sports visitor program, um, it brings international uh, coaches and administrators and international kind of amateur uh, non-elite youth athletes to the U.S. Uh, for two week long international exchange programs. So they're sports based, cultural, person to person exchange programs. Um, and, you know, they always focus on a specific theme, uh, the main ones being disability rights and inclusion through sports, women's empowerment through sports, uh, and all of them touch on some sort of kind of positive youth development as well. Um, so as opposed to say like, you know, a university going out and recruiting an international student or something like that, or a professional sports club, bringing a professional player from abroad, this is really kind of like, uh, grassroots, literally sports diplomacy. So we're using sports as a, as a vector to connect with, uh, you know, professionals and youth from all around the world to come here, to exchange culture, um, to exhibit what the U.S. has to offer in the sporting space, um, to give the participants the chance to interact with American citizens, which they, you know, typically would, would never have. Um, yeah, so... That's kind of like the overall gist of the sports visitor program. We also have the the sports envoy program, which sends typically kind of like higher level, uh, either current or retired uh, athletes and coaches from the U.S. abroad. So they're slightly shorter programs. Um, they work a lot with the U.S. embassies and the other countries. We kind of work on helping them get over overseas so they can do their um, they can do their trips. But we've We've sent people like Alex Morgan, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, um, and many other people. Tony Sano from the U.S. Men's National Team. Like we send, we send some some pretty impressive people abroad um, to to meet with local youth and local uh, community based sports organizations, and sometimes all the way up to like Ministry of Sport level um, for varying different topics based on what the embassy proposal for the program is. So. Yeah, long long winded answer there, but we can kind of get into more specifics on stuff uh, as as you're interested in. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so was it also you guys that sent Dennis Rodman to North Korea? We didn't. We didn't do that. No, they that was uh, I think uh, some sort of NBA trip they took. That that one wasn't us. No. Apparently, they're like best friends now. Him and Kim Jong Un. Anyways, it's a different form of sports diplomacy, yeah. you know. Um. So how do you, so you mentioned that the ones that come over here are not elite athletes, which makes sense yeah. given my question before we started, which is how do you like, you're not scouting for 
exactly. colleges or teams anyways. So how do you pick how do you pick them? Yeah. You know, like, is it a lottery system? Do you people apply? How does it work? That's a good question. And it, it varies per program. So as, as I mentioned with the Envoy program, it's the same thing with the visitor program that we're working with the U.S. embassies in different countries. So I'll kind of run through the the cycle per year of how it works and then like how participants get selected, et cetera. But um, basically, uh, the Department of State, our, our client at the Sports Diplomacy Division, sends out a, a call for proposals to U.S. embassies each year. Um, do you want to sure. uh, host or put forth a sports visitor or sports envoy program. And if they're interested, they'll put a proposal in. Uh, we work with the state department to kind of pick the the top ones, uh, the ones that make most sense to show a lot of like commitment to alumni follow on, particularly when they go back to their country. Um, and then, you know, once they're selected, we get in touch with the embassy uh, and the embassies are they actually the people who, who select the participants. So they, they typically, you know, they're a bit more tapped into their community. They know who the leaders are in these spaces, or they at least know the people that they can get in touch with. Um, and, you know, they know who, who youth leaders are, who adult leaders are. So um, the process of how they get picked is like sometimes they'll put out a call for applications like in their networks and they'll get they'll get like a ton of applications and go through them and pick through that. Sometimes they'll kind of know who they want to pick and like, they just go in their network of people they have. So it really kind of varies like case by case on how the embassy wants to do it uh, when, when they do the selection. But once they select the participants, uh, they kind of get all the info over to our team uh, at FHI 360. And, and then from there, we really pick up everything where we we organize all the logistics of like getting the visas, getting, getting them uh, the flights, like their lodging, everything here. And then literally like, crafting the program that they'll do while they're here so they may meet with uh you know professional sports organizations like angel city fc we've met with them before um we've had you know we've had uh dj sackman do basketball training he's like a high level trainer who works with a lot of nba players we'll do uh mental health in sports with organizations like train the mind um dr kensley gunter as an example and then we'll work with a lot of universities as well. So we've, we've partnered with, uh, we're, we're actually have one coming up where we're partnering with University of Oregon, UCLA, USC out on the West Coast. And we've, we've done things kind of all over the country. So looking at our geographical diversity, we really try to like get it all over the country. So not only are we, are we meeting with like, obviously experts in their field, but like giving different uh, views of the U.S., um, to different groups when they come. So they're not just going to LA, they're not just going to New York. Like sometimes they go to Texas, sometimes they go to uh, Minnesota, et cetera. So um, yeah, that's, I kind of went a little further than just the participant selection, but uh, oh, that's good. yeah, that, that gets into a little bit of the process of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting that they, that the embassies select. I mean, I guess, I guess it makes sense, but I was talking um, the last podcast with a guy named Jason. He was asking how, we were talking about soccer and the youth development and how teams find players. And I was like, you know, the extent the scouting networks are so extensive, they'll find dudes on dirt fields playing with trash bags rolled up in the ball and yeah. shoes as the goals. And so I, I wonder from the embassy perspective, they have to have some level of means to even oh. know that the embassy yeah. is calling out for these um exactly participants and so when they come to the u.s what's interesting to me is the other part that's interesting is and maybe you can answer this by the, the actual purpose of or one of the purposes of what it is but you if you bring over some let's just say for argument's sake that they're a, an average high school athlete probably yeah. not talented enough to play in college maybe d3 somewhere whatever their sport is and you show them the USC and UCLA facilities. It's not, that's not, are you, I guess, are you showing, you're showing them the best of the best of what we have essentially close to it because that's not something that they would ever experience. So I guess, so they're here for two weeks. So what is the, is it, they're not really going to get better at the sport in two weeks. They might learn a few things, mm -hmm. but yeah. they're not, they're not training. It's not a camp. They're traveling and they're meeting people. But what is the, 
criteria or what is the not, criteria is not the right word. What is the point? I guess so you just sort of bring somebody over so they can meet some people and then you send them back. Is that it? Like, or what, when, when, the, what is the mission statement? I guess, does that make yeah. sense? What I'm asking? It does. Yeah. So I, that's a good question too. The, I think the mission statement, um, is typically like we we want to really utilize the the connective power of sport because uh, like you know we we understand you can you can connect with somebody through sport get stepping on a field without even being able to sp speak the same language as them um, that's how I've personally been able to connect to a lot of people uh, it's like I'm huge into into soccer so I've like I kind of know a lot of different professional players from a lot of places so I can you know right off the bat just from that like a lot of countries I can just inform someone that I at least know something about where they're from. So yeah. we, we want to use the connective power of sport to, you know, have that cross-cultural connection. And we also, um, aside from just exhibiting what the U.S. has to offer and, like, showing off things like that, like, um, we, want, we want to give a lot of, like, capacity building and, like, professional development to the, to the participants so that they're really getting a lot out of this program. Um, and, you know, the embassy will pick the themes based on needs in the, in the community that, that they see. And um, they see sport as a way to connect with people on those topics in a way that they couldn't have done without sport. Um, so, yeah, like, for example, we, um, one of the youth programs, actually the youth track of the program does bring youth to come and at, uh, participate in an existing sports camp so the adults don't do that but the youth do and they come in the summer so one of the main partners we have for that is uh julie fowdy and espmw uh sports leadership academy which is it's an all-female program so we bring it typically about 50 to 60 international like female youth it used to be just soccer but now it's basketball as well they have tamika catchings is leading the basketball side uh you know former WNBA legend, all Hall of Famer. Um, so not only are they getting some of that really good training, they they may actually really improve some of their their sports skills while they're getting training from people like that, but they're yeah. also getting leadership training. Like um there's there's a pretty like pretty uh robust um like classroom curriculum for for that week of the program. And then for the other week, uh FHI 360 will like kind of see what maybe uh but that leadership academy doesn't offer and we'll we'll kind of put together like a number of different resources like public speaking workshops so people can like learn how to do storytelling and then like relay it to people um you know to an audience so like th there are valuable skills that they're learning on these programs um and another another component of the program is we we offer some small grant funding and project planning skills like very basic project planning skills um, so like they get trained on that early on in the program, they work on their project plan. We call it action plan projects. Um, uh, they, they may address some sort of need that, that they as individuals see in their community through sport, and they can apply for a certain amount of funding that once they go back home, they can apply to us for that. And like the department of state through us, will send that fund, those funds to them. So, um, we see we have a lot like over the, over the past five years we've got like 150 200 alumni projects that we've funded and we've got the they're, they're really doing some great stuff in their community so they're like even though they're getting some small funding through that like they're getting practice you know applying for grant um using the skills that maybe th they had and or enhanced or learned while they're here uh to actually do things in their community that make a difference so um i think that's like certainly for our team and the Department of State, that's what we really love to see is, um, you know, those those people, those participants coming here, making the most out of that two weeks, maybe a once in a lifetime opportunity for a lot of people, um, which it would be the same for me if I had a two week exchange going somewhere else. Um, yeah. So that, like I think uh, program impact um, is really what we're looking for, uh, like maximizing that impact and offering different skills and, and outcomes for, for the participants.
Yeah, the funding piece really answered the question to that. It's like, okay, yeah. you send you they come here, they learn some stuff, and you send them back, and they still have nothing. It's like that's not very right. helpful. But no, the funding piece that's answered the last that, thing that we want to do. Yeah. Right. And that's why I asked because I, I was like, I'm missing something here. So the funding piece definitely makes sense because I'm looking at it through such a soccer lens where if I was going to go somewhere for two weeks and without the opportunity to to prove myself and stay or get like get something more permanent, right. like, why would I even why would I even go? Um, yeah, obviously, obviously for these people coming here is, is different. And so I that probably came off as very first world problem me. <laughs> but and then one thing one thing I can say too, or a few things actually, is like, you know, for a lot of people, we there are youth that have been on programs that are now current like collegiate NCAA student athletes at colleges mm. here. So like there is that like we do want to see like, that like ideally for me, like if I if I'm putting together a, a program and like I'm picking these specific partners for specific reasons based on the on the embassy's proposal to us. Uh, I would love for those for like our participants to keep those connections going after they go home. So like, yeah, that's something we want to happen as well. And that does happen. Um, we've had, you know, people work on virtual programs together. We've had people at times go from the US abroad and like visit and, and do workshops in these places. And like, maybe they'll go for a week and do a, a soccer camp, like paired up with some of the participants that are now uh, that are program alumni. Um, yeah, so there is the opportunity for the youth to come here, study abroad. Um, there's the opportunity to get those professional like networks built up internationally and like, uh, you know, moving forward. And then, um, for the youth, even who don't come or, or for maybe coaches who don't necessarily keep those contacts going, like it, it can still be a good thing to be able to put on your resume professionally, even if it's just that. So, Oh, for sure. Um, like th there's a lot to take out of it on, on those fronts for them. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So you've, okay. So now we've selected the participants and, um, now from your end now, what, so you say, okay, yeah. well, when they put out the call for people, is it, do they s filter based on sport or age or any of those things? Or is that your job to sort through a pile of people and be like, these yeah. seven people are all soccer people and these eight people are all basketball people and these 10 people are all track people. Is that you guys or is that beforehand? That's you guys. Yep. Okay, that's the so embassy. That's so that'll, that'll be the embassy that does uh -huh. that. And then like they'll, so I'll clarify also when they send proposals to us, they'll already like pick the sport out and the theme. So like they're going to know, for example, I have a, uh, we had a group come from Fiji, Kiribati, and Tonga, and they were they were rugby uh, like former players and coaches. And like when when the embassy applied for that proposal, like rugby was on there. So um, you know there there was other themes to that program that we didn't just focus on rugby. Obviously, I think Tonga and Fiji are maybe a little better than the U.S. at rugby, so uh, they don't necessarily need to learn like those skills. But um, you know they're, they're coming here. They're they're getting different community development like uh trainings like one thing that a lot of them wanted to learn was like how they can organize their like after school sports programs maybe that they're running and like different like uh management processes for that and a couple of them wanted some strength and conditioning and training so like we we got a little bit of that for them as well so you kind of like try to match up with the participant profile you have as, as much as possible. And then um, what the embassy is looking for as well. So, okay. So you've got the proposal in, you know, the sport, you know, kind of the profile of the people coming, then what? So then you've got, yeah. do you have a list of partners that is already existing or are you reaching out to new people all the time or how does that work? Both. So if, if there's something that really makes sense as a fit, um, for example, like, every year we bring a group to the United soccer coaches, like coaches convention. Um, so like we'll re that's a partnership we want to keep going. Like I said, we we've, we've worked a few years in a row with Julie Foudy and Tamika and ESPNW on that camp. Um, and there's certain organizations that like, they have such expertise in a field that if we're, if we're doing a program on a certain thing, it makes sense to partner with them. But at the same time, we, we want to keep, growing our our like partner network and and work with different organizations and people and entities so it's a little bit of both where we'll we'll go back to our kind of network that we have and like rely on our resource that we have already in place but we also will do a lot of research um 
with each program that's coming and each group that's coming on like, you know, specific locations to go or specific organizations to partner with. So how do you pick those? Let's, let's say you've got some people coming over for, um, I don't know, track. Yeah. And you've got a good track team at somebody who's listening to this is going to shoot me in the face. I'll just make up two schools. We'll say, uh, we'll say Penn state and I don't know, uh, Texas both have good track teams. Right. I don't know. I don't know if they do. I just made that up. But how do you? What differentiating factors? Where are you at with? You're know, like, are you like, okay, well, we were just in the Northeast last year, so maybe we'll go to Texas this time, and then last year we were in this place, so but we want to have them go to this other workshop that's in Texas, so maybe we'll do that one. Is it is it just kind of how it fits together generally? It can be that. Yeah, we do want to like as mentioned, we want to get the geographic diversity of like uh, within the U S where, where groups are visiting. So that's part of it. Um, as I mentioned with, uh, with, the, with each, uh, proposal, they'll, they'll send the sport and they'll also kind of like have some program themes. Um, so that can dictate like, for example, if it's, if it's a disability rights and inclusion program, we want to partner with some top level adaptive sports, uh, programs and, you know, collegiately in the U S there's, it's growing a lot. Um, but University of Alabama and the University of Arizona have really top level uh, adaptive sports programs so like wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby. Um, so we partnered with like University of Arizona in particular quite a lot on those. Um, we partnered, as I said, with the University of Alabama. So like that might dictate where we're going, obviously. And then we'll, you know, build out around um around that location, like different entities that are there that match up with other aspects of what we want to do with the programs. So if it's, if it's that, say it's a disability rights and uh, inclusion program, and they, they want to focus on adaptive sports like wheelchair basketball, um, but there's also maybe an inclusion on, or a, a piece on like finding a way to use sport to reach out to and include like maybe a marginalized group in a community. Like we might go to, you know, University of Arizona and then work with an organization there also that like does that in maybe Phoenix or Tucson in that region um, that is, is at that point based on our research and we may tap into other you know partners we've worked with that that know the the area as well um, yeah so that so that goes into it and then another part is if there's a way we can link it up with a big event that's happening like that United Soccer Coaches Convention or for example, an upcoming program that's actually going to kick off next week. Uh, we're going to Los Angeles because the Pac-12 track and field outdoor championships are there. And the group that's coming is a track and field group. And the embassy wants us to focus on like connecting with a lot of uh, basically universities. So that makes sense. That's a fit, right? Um, and we and like just for us, we've already worked with a fair amount of Pac-12 schools. So the connection's already there. Um so that that's just an example of how like the gears work in putting the program together. So if you've been doing this for a while, not you in particular, but if somebody's been doing this for a while, you can kind of have almost templates built out of totally this sport. We're gonna send them here, here, and here, and for the northeast and here, here, and here for the southwest, and for a track, we're gonna send them here and here for this region and there and there for the other region. So how yeah. I guess the only flip side to that or not flip side, but the, the kind of wrench that would get thrown in there would be if there's big events happening that you have to tweak things here and there. And to do that, mm -hmm. you'd have to have your finger on the pulse. Cause it's not like, it's not like, well, maybe it is like, it's not like you guys are getting briefings on, Hey, by the way, uh, pack 12 is running their championships next week. Is that just something that you're supposed to just keep an eye on generally for your job or or is this something that you guys are sitting down and going through the ESPN app and saying okay this game is this week and this tournament's next week and maybe we can send these people over here because whatever thing is happening yeah it's a little bit of like both where it's yeah you want to obviously working in like sports industry and trying to partner with all these um different entities like it's good obviously to have your finger on the pulse of what's going on um, but it is also a lot of like very specific tailored research based on each like actual like proposal that we get. So um, 
like maybe not the ESPN app, but definitely Google, a lot of Google, yeah, um, of course, getting on the official, you know, the official websites and seeing where the, where the events are taking place. And then, you know, once, once you know about the certain type of events, you know, they kind of rotate around geographically. So, uh, you know, the program that partners with United soccer coaches convention, like that's obviously going to be in a different city each year. Cause it rotates around this in Philly a lot. It's been in Chicago. It's been in Baltimore. It goes around, you know, um, and then, you know, we build out off of that, like in whatever city it is. And then, uh, we'll pick, there's always typically two cities we go to for each week of the program. So if there's one week that's focused on maybe, um, you know, one of those events, like we might bring a soccer group to Kansas city to go meet with like us soccer there or something. If it, it just makes sense based on what, um, They'd lose what brain cells is? if they met with U.S. soccer, dude. What's that? I said they'd lose brain cells if they met with U.S. soccer. Well, man. you, should, we've, you shouldn't we've, be doing we've, that. We've, we've met with U.S. soccer and we partnered with them. So uh, <laughs> I meant that's... U.S. soccer is the best and we're going to win the World Cup in 2026. Yeah, U.S. soccer. Let's go. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, when you're bringing uh, – when you're bringing – you're bringing groups from other countries that may on, you know, like if we have Brazilian youth coming, which we have like – some of they at times may have access to some some really good training down there. So, uh, yeah, we're not necessarily trying to like teach them that we're like better at them than a sport or something. We're just uh, what we have to exhibit is what we have to exhibit, you know. So we're that's yeah. what we go with. All right, I want to move to the envoy sending people abroad. Yeah. So are you guys the ones that say if you and I had a teammate? that maybe didn't have a European passport and some coach in, oh, I don't know, say Wales or Germany was like, hey, I want to take a look at you. Are you guys the ones that help with that? No? No, that's not really under the auspices what we're doing. So we're, we're um, it's really that same like cultural diplomacy thing where it's like uh, that that program really is focusing on sending one or one to two i mean they don't necessarily have to be an absolute like top level coach or athlete but like uh, you know the the profiles of the envoys sometimes do reach that level um well yeah if you're sending so, Shaq overseas i mean that yeah that kind of yeah but it's not always not always Shaq. we get we get people that are maybe they they work in a sport but they're like subject matter experts in something they might be like a mental health expert or like positive they're, they do a lot of work with youth, uh, youth mm -hmm. programs. So like they might be selected for a reason like that as well. Um, but yeah, it's really not at all kind of like getting affiliated with sending like players to like join teams. It's, it's really that like community development, uh, yeah. cultural diplomacy through sports, like focus for that program. So when you send, send somebody over somewhere, is there, you're not just sending people Willy nilly, is there? Yeah. A, there's also the proposal that comes in from the yeah. embassy, and they're like, "Hey, we see a need here. Can you find somebody to go for X Y Z reason?" And Pretty much, and yeah. You guys so are we, like, hey, we we've a... got four people that meet this profile. We'll reach out to these four, and yeah. one of them said, "Yes, okay, here you go." Yep, oh, yep. That's how it works. At times, the embassy actually may select like specific people. Uh, typically, if they're doing that, obviously they're a little higher level, like somebody that you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's, we get the proposals from the embassies. We, we do go through that same like selection process um, of selecting those proposals. And then at that point um, on the Envoy program in particular, it's really a lot like the programming part of it is a lot more with like the U.S. embassy is going to work with their local partner, which may be like, uh, you know, if it's a running program, it might be like a running club in, Cairo, Egypt, for example, is like a program that's happened. Um, and then, you know, if they have somebody in mind, we'll do our best to to make that happen. It doesn't always work out. Uh, and if it doesn't, we we have contacts and like, you know, a whole history of envoys that have gone and uh, c contacts with like, you know, maybe USA Triathlon or USA Soccer or like the NBA, where the, the, we can then get in touch with with those contacts and they work to 
through their like players organizations uh they kind of like send the, the feelers down to see who might want to go uh and it, and it goes from there um they can vary uh based on the program of how that works like you know obviously if somebody's trying to pick uh, a basketball program that's happening now they're not going to get jason tatum because he's in the playoffs they're you're not going to get somebody who's in season yeah. um but uh you know in the off season is typically when they would go uh and it just it just a lot of coordination with the embassy uh on on all fronts on that yeah all right, cheesiest question, and then we can move on to other things. What's the most rewarding uh, either experience you've had taking bringing people here or sending abroad? Yeah, I mean, I it's hard to pick, honestly, like one experience. I'm going to kind of just speak generally, but like sure. I think uh, I, the, the most rewarding part of this to me is that uh, – you know, we have WhatsApp groups where we, we text everybody and like we still have groups from when I started that like I still get like 10 texts a day from that group. So like we stay connected. Um, I've had the opportunity to go visit a, a couple of groups, uh, one in particular in Indonesia, which was awesome. So we did like a reverse exchange and brought a couple of the program partners that they met with in the U.S. back to their communities uh, in in a couple of the communities there. Um one of the one of the communities hadn't had any American visitors in 30 years, and then we came, and then the other community had never had any. So, like, we're we're there uh, offering some some workshops, some some training sessions through soccer, and also just like meeting people and giving them the experience to to meet some people they never would have the chance to meet. And for me, it's like I get to meet people I never would have had the chance to meet, and now I have like friends everywhere across the world because of this program so that's that's really pretty awesome uh for me you know yeah i can see why that would be the case having friends in other countries is cool so like for me i obviously don't have what you've done but just through soccer have having friends in germany england sweden wherever yeah. it's like it's cool because you maybe you don't talk to them that much but you follow them on social media and you see somebody that you're friends with who's Spanish and they're visiting the Philippines and then they've got, they post some pictures and you're like, Oh, how was the trip? They're like, Oh, it was really cool. And then somebody else that you were friends with played a, a year of soccer in Australia or yeah. whatever the case is. And, and you get to see the world through other places as well and see what things are, are really like, which is why for this, I want to touch on your experience in Sweden mm, yeah. because uh, I'm pretty sure by this point, probably nobody's listening, <laughs> but, but it's all right. But the people who do, there are some of the people that you and I both know from the various teams that we played on together. And yeah. I don't, I feel like um, some of the, some of these people that maybe don't understand what it takes to get over there and then what it's actually like once you're there. So if you care to elaborate. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I played, um, we go a whole background. I played obviously growing up, I played in high school. Um, yeah, I played division three in college at Hendricks college down in Conway, Arkansas. Um, you know, did well down there and then spent a couple of years as the assistant coach for the men and women for that same school. Uh, men and women's soccer. Uh, and I, I very randomly got the chance to get a trial over in Sweden um, with a division three club called Friska Villar FC in Örnsköldsvik, Sweden, which is kind of like halfway up the country. It's not anywhere near Stockholm. It's not anywhere near uh, Gothenburg or Malmo. It's up in hockey country. But um, what happened with that was I, I basically just had to be ready like to go on trial at any point and like at that stage in my life I was kind of at a point where it was like I was 25 so that's pretty late to be getting over there you know yeah uh, I I at that you know I'd always wanted to go play in Europe and just generally play as a high level as I could uh, as most players kind of do I think um, and somebody visited our college from from uh Sweden who happened to have a connection with this club 
And I just happened to meet him while he's here and like mention, he mentioned that that club, you know, always looking to bring in a couple players every off season. And I kind of just was like, you need a center back. Uh, I'm your guy. Um, and yeah, that my friend Yari, who I'm talking about, he, uh, yeah, I mean, he really went out of his way to, to kind of get me over there. So I think it, it in, t- in terms of like answering what your question, it, it takes a little bit of luck. Not everybody's uh, blessed with Neymar like skills. I'm certainly not. Um, but it, it it's a matter of like getting the chance, which a lot of people maybe don't get being ready to take the chance, which means like staying super fit all the time and playing as much as you can. Um, even at a point where you're kind of like at that stage, I wasn't really playing competitively at that point, but um, yeah, getting over there. Uh, <laughs> I went over there with like a one way plane ticket with like just a trial with no contract um, spent a couple weeks training with a few different teams, uh, that one being the main one, but there's, you know, a, a ton of teams around that are, they're always looking for players. Um, so I had, had a couple of trials with a few other teams, but yeah, that, that club in particular really gave me the chance to kind of train with them for like two weeks. Um, and then, you know, after, after they had me there for that amount of time, they, they wanted to keep me on. So I, I stayed with them for two seasons uh, we finished in second place both seasons. The second season, we won our promotion playoff and, and got promoted. And that was a pretty pretty cool experience. Um, but yeah, and it's not that easy going over a place you've never been when you're not used to really traveling a lot. You know, I had a, a long-term girlfriend. I left at home for like eight months for like the season. Uh, and I did that two years in a row. Uh, so that wasn't easy. So it, it takes a lot of like dedication and... Uh, just sticking with it um, and and just working super hard and trying to take every chance you can really, you know. What was the preparation like for you? Because when you were coaching, were you still <clears throat> training and playing like you wanted to go or was it you met the guy and you're like, oh shit, I got to get back in shape? So luckily I, I always kind of was really hard working with working out and stuff. And I like, I was definitely still working out. Luckily being the coach, I could train with the, like with the teams if I wanted to, like, you know, a lot of times you, you, you know, you're doing a full field scrimmage. You got a couple of guys out. You need someone to step in. I could do oh, that. I, I, was, I do that now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like that helped obviously being able to keep training pretty regularly with college, current college players, you know? Um, so that kept me fit. Obviously I wasn't totally match fit, but I had enough of a, advanced knowledge that I was going a few months that I could really like train hard and I got in really good shape. Um, yeah. And like, like when we were doing fitness tests, I was like, just because I had the prep time, I was able to like, you know, finish in the top five in the team. So no problems on that front. It's the main thing that was kind of tough was, uh, even though it wasn't, it's not like I was playing in the premier league or even the first division over there, which is called all Spence gun or super ethan second division that are, good levels, you know, probably pretty comparable to like MLS. Um, I wasn't playing up at that level, but like, it's a lot more technical game over in Sweden and like Scandinavia in particular, Europe in general, but like, I think that those Scandinavian countries are pretty well known for being super technical on the ball. A lot of really good touches, fast pace of game, very good passing, like one, two touch. So like for me coming from division three, Arkansas, like, a little bit of a step up on that stuff so it took a little time to get used to the speed of the game and just the style of play but um yeah getting used to that could you know you you get with a team and you play a season with them you know I got into the swing of it after a few games pretty pretty quick and started pretty much all the games when I was fit you know so yeah division three in Arkansas lots of long ball yeah, I mean, we had some good players in there. You, you, there's, uh, there's definitely some long ball going on. Yeah, like, no, don't get me wrong, but I think you'd be, you'd be surprised. I think a lot of people would be surprised. We had, we had a couple players in that team. I mean, I wasn't the best player in that team, even. So, like, we had a couple guys that were like all region players, like all South, like two guys that were just going back and forth, breaking the goals record, at, like because they were playing at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Soccer is a weird one in, in the U.S. and college. Though. Well, basketball, I guess, to a lesser extent as well. You can see some big upsets in, in basketball. Yeah. But soccer is a weird one where you get these 
JUCOs or your community yeah. colleges that are filled with internationals or kids that were super talented but didn't have the grades to go because the big schools don't – they have scholarships to give for soccer, but it's not to the yeah. point of an Alabama giving a football scholarship to a kid that – like they'll make it work for football or for basketball yeah. at these at these big schools in soccer. They're not really they don't have as much leeway. So you get these JUCOs and these community colleges. Um, AI. Yeah, yeah. And CCBC Essex, where Omar coaches. Shout out Omar. Yeah. Uh, and our and our boy Ethan went who just transferred to Coastal Carolina. Congrats to him. It's a good option. Yeah. Yeah, and and these and you go from these community colleges straight to D one schools and they're stepping into teams and playing well. So it's weird for like the, the divisions don't matter as much, which is, it's, it's, it's interesting. It and, you, and you see that um, when the USL two rosters come out every summer where it's like, Oh, this guy played at Villanova and this guy played at this community college. And this guy plays for some random school you've never heard of in the middle of nowhere. And, and they all mix. And then, you got some yeah. foreign kids come in and the levels are just kind of, cause people develop at different pay. And you know, this about me, I didn't even play for my school team, but right. if you, yeah. if you didn't know that about me, like I have kids that I coach or people that I play with now ask if I ever played pro and it's like, right. no, no, didn't, didn't. So it's weird. So actually, so talk to me about the fitness levels because how, yeah. how much fitter, so in my head, I have a baseline of fitness where I think that I'm in good shape, and you and you the same. Was were you surprised by the speed and strength when you went over there, or was or was this the raw physical ability of the college players similar enough that it wasn't so bad? That's another thing where you get into the weird spot on the levels of of all of this, of both the college and the, mm -hmm. uh, like where I was. So like, I, like when I was playing with Frisco Villar, they were fifth tier in Sweden. So it was like division three broken down regionally, like the way it works, like super Athon is second division. That's like the, the top two flights have just the one, uh, league. That's yeah. like a whole country. And then and you get to division three there. Um, it's still good, uh, or division one, sorry, it's their third tier, but it's called division one. Um, then that split like two regional like leagues. And then you keep going down the leagues and it like spreads out geographically. It's similar to how they do things here with like UPSL and stuff like that. And like, um, so when I was there, it was like, which actually kind of matches up with my experience in division three soccer is like, the top guys in that league were like super fit, super strong, super fast. Like you'll see guys. We had guys in our team that were 18 that are now playing in all defense gun. Like, so like, obviously those guys are a little different. Like they have a different, like natural ability. Um, there are some guys that are, I played a guy against center forward. That was like six, four, super fast. Could you could not get in this guy off the ball? And he's like scoring with his feet in his head. Like it's nothing. It's like 40 goals, you know? Um, but then there's also, <laughs> there's also guys at the bottom of the league that it's like, I don't even know if this guy's going to complete a beep test or like, it's, I don't know what's going on. It's like, and it, it's kind of the same with like our division three team. Like there was, there was me and there was like a good number of guys that took it, took the fitness part super seriously. But like another part of D3 is like some guys choose that because like they might be very talented players, but like they're choosing, they don't want to do that anymore. Like they don't want to be at a D1 school and like have to put all that time in. They want to play and still have a good level, but they want to focus more on maybe like becoming a lawyer or a doctor. So like you get a big mix. Um, so it, it, I, I don't know if that answers it, but it's like a very no, mixed thing where like the high end, I, it's like, yeah, I, I struggle to keep up with a, a couple of guys at times because like they're, they have something a little different and then you, you know, they either had just come down from a higher level or they're on their way up, you know? So like they, they have something a little different than the rest of the league. Um, I think a good example of like talking about the Juco stuff is like my first year we had this, there's a program in Sweden where they, they get a ton of English, a young English guys that like, that had come up through their academy systems at all these different clubs, like big clubs sometimes, you know? but they didn't get that senior contract when they turned 18, but they were still like 
very good players, you know, like, so they had a program where like those guys could come to Sweden for a couple of years or a year. And like, they, they would really facilitate those kids coming over. So like our goalkeeper, our second year was like out of Liverpool's Academy. And like, now he's, he's, he moved up and was in the first division and second division and stuff. Um, very good. What's we his had name? him when he was like 21, you know, what's his um, name? His name's Andrew Mills. Um, Andrew I'm not sure where he's at now. Mills. I know um, he may be just back in England now, but uh, he was really good for us. I mean, he with our goalkeeper, we got promoted. He Ostersunds is the Swedish team, right? Ostersund, yeah, that's where he was. He was at Ostersund. Let's see. Um, Transfermarket.com. Yeah, at, at one point, they were, they were in the top flight, and at one point, I think they were, they were in that Europa League playing against Arsenal at that stadium. It wasn't when he was with them. That was like Maybe when I was there, Grand Potter was their manager. Ooh, twenty nine now age for him. Eesh. That's Something how long like that. ago it was. Yeah, I was playing yeah. in twenty fifteen with him. Yeah, and he was twenty one. So yeah, he's still at Ostersund. That's awesome. I didn't realize he was still there. I know that he he goes back and forth, and he like he works in Liverpool uh, with like he trains kids at not you know, but I guess that's in his off season. But we had another guy. I'm trying to remember what. It might have been Middlesbrough, but he got released. Um, his name <laughs> – hopefully I'm not getting this wrong. His name's Carlton McKenzie. He came – he played with us for half a season through that same program. We're going to give it a Google, Colton. Yeah, but he, he transferred here. He went to Tyler Community College and was, like, very good there. And then he transferred and played at Seton Hall. And now he's, like, I think bouncing around some of the, uh, like, USL, NASL-type levels. I know he got his, like, his MBA also while he was here, so he's – Last I saw was up in New York City, but like this is a kid who like absolutely blistering pace, like drip, like footwork ridiculous, finishing ridiculous, super strong, and like yeah, he come here and play Division One soccer, you know. So yeah, um, it, it's just know. interesting how you have all those different levels of that stuff, you know. Yeah, and it's cool also that uh, over there the. It was also funny. I, I spelled his name wrong and Weston McKinney popped up. And then I. Yeah, Carlton McKenzie. Yeah. Yeah. And then I found him afterwards. Um, but it's cool over there that they have these programs to facilitate. Yeah. I didn't know about that beforehand either. But yeah. It's, yeah, it's interesting. Because here, well, one, I think it's helpful that they're all under that. So normally, as a general rule, I'm all for things not being under big central umbrellas because yeah. I think it's not very efficient and there's too many variables to have blanket policies for things generally. Um, but one of the things that the European countries do is all of these teams are under their, their like governing body of football, like their FA or whatever. Yeah. 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 Whatever it is. And so you don't have like here we have MLS and then USL championship and then USL one and then NISA and USL two. And USL is its own organization that isn't yeah. at all related to MLS, and NISA isn't at all related to USL. And so there's no, oh, this team did really well. They're going to jump up to the next division, and maybe they've got this youth team. What's actually kind of weird is, and then there's this MLS Next Pro thing. So yeah. you heard that's, about that's that. That's kind of so, newish for the past few years, right? Yeah. So a lot of these MLS teams have pulled their second teams out of USL Championship and into this other thing, which I, which like, I get, but also why they have why? a better chance i think at usl of playing against like older players and maybe prepare them a bit more you know well i agree and that's what yeah and that's what kind of one of the things that we've done with virginia dream is taken a few of the yeah. um young players from the teams that that i coach and if Don't they're ready on that yeah i mean it, there's a lot if of these, they're ready like, we bring them to training and it's like and they get yeah. it's like shell shocked a little bit at first and then they settle in and then they've got to adjust how they play because they realize they can't dribble by people anymore yeah and they've got to figure it out there was one kid there was one kid the first time i talked to him this kid's super talented i was like you need to take less touches because when you get to the old like when you get up to the next level defenders are going to be able to take it from like take it from you and he was like well maybe we'll, we'll do a lot of things that you didn't said, expect yeah and he said well i'll just also get bigger and faster so i can still dribble by them right and i said no <laughs> if you work super hard you might but even then yeah. maybe not yeah well, it's like yeah. we'll see when you get to that age it's like yeah, people develop sure. differently you know 
I was like, I like that that was your answer, but also you need to develop that side of your game. And then now nah, he's, he's such a good kid. I think he'll go far. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's good. It's good. And I think, oh, I don't know. May, do less people slip through the cracks in Europe, do you think? I don't know. Because I, I think, think so. Cause I, I, was, think I was about to say, because my, of what you were just saying. Yeah, because I think of my own situation personally, and, and I don't know. But also, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I was... When you're when you're 16 and you don't know what you want to do with your life and you're like oh I have no chance of doing like if somebody if somebody had told me when I was 16 that I would have been in Mexico then maybe I would have treated life differently I don't yeah. know but also I was 16 when you're 16 yeah. you don't you don't know shit and then that's why it's bonkers when you see Jude Bellingham at 19 captaining Dortmund in the Champions League and you're like yeah. what was I doing at 19 uh, not going to Spanish class in college but that's like... but I think it's like the the system so I, yeah I think you, I think do, less people do fall through the cracks because it is under that single system like and I can in Sweden a country like that or England they're, they're not that different in size I think England has more people but like because they're all under like the FA like I told you that there was a few kids that have moved up you know, when I was playing with them in 2015 and they were 18, 19, and now they're whatever age they are now, mid twenties. And they're like, they've developed really well. And it's like, it's because they have all of that under the same system and they're scouting all of those levels and they know there's young guys at all those levels. And it's the same. There's a reason Jude Bellingham got signed by Birmingham when he was however old, like 16. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, he's, he got seen with a different club. I mean, maybe he, I don't actually know if he came up. Like, maybe I should know I think that. Okay. He he went. Up, I'm pretty sure he went up through their through their academy, which is why they yeah. were which is why they retired his jersey number, right, went, right, at yeah. eighteen or whenever he left. Which I also thought was weird, and I don't actually. But it's know rare that to come all the way through up through that. Yeah. So it's like a lot of times it's like yeah, you're picking up, you know, Arsenal signing a kid from somebody else's academy. Maybe it's a lower level club. I mean, yeah, sometimes they come up all the way. Yeah, but, he was from. He played for Birmingham since he was U8. Yeah, and I think Jack Realish is similar with, like, Villa, but, like, um, maybe not. I don't. I probably should stop talking about people's backgrounds when I no, don't no, know. No, 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 dude, you've gotten them all uh, right so far. Keep going. <laughs> no, but it's, like, you know, in terms of when he got to the club is what I'm saying. But, like, yeah, yeah. It's, he got to it just Villa gives those, it, it, when he was six. I think it gives everyone the chance. It gives more people at a younger age a chance of playing with a club that like you'll be playing with older guys and like developing your game and you can you can start in that fifth tier, especially in Sweden. Like I mean, even with Jamie Vardy in England, he was playing non-league football until pretty old, and then he's one of the best strikers of the Premier League of the past five years. You know, mm -hmm. um, five plus years maybe. But uh, yeah, like you, I think at a younger age you get a better shot of not getting let through the cracks. But it's like breaking into that top level is still like that. Oh, half a percent so or less you know like yeah that's why you see so many I th i'm not sure what organization runs that like english program i was talking about maybe other countries all do that mm -hmm. i just know that english england did it a lot with where i was um but it's like those kids have that's been their whole focus they didn't focus as much on school i think academies bigger academies are doing better now with like offering like the schooling as well so they have other skills but like the reason that the program is, it exists is because, statistically speaking, almost none of those kids are going to go to the first teams that they're at. Even yeah. if, like, you hear stories of, like, a kid captained their academy teams all the way through up and then nothing. And then they didn't get a contract where they were or anywhere else. So it's like, if they offer them this chance to go, like, go to a different country, play a couple seasons there, like, it's at least giving them, like, a buffer in between and giving them the opportunity to like get out on their own a bit more. And like, I think that builds a lot of like personal development for the, for the guys, you know? Yeah. That's the thing. Well, the two things, one is the skills development outside of, outside of football, because I know I was talking to, I don't know, various people. I'm like, that's the one thing that the U S college system does a bit better is if they yeah. don't play anywhere afterwards, they can, they have a degree and they can go do things. Um, but to your point about a kid captaining his youth team all the way up through like the U20, U23s and then nothing. There are kids that come out of the best teams in the world, like City, United, um, Bayern Munich, like all these teams. 
and to be that good for for the Barcelona U23 team or for the Real Madrid U20 Real like Real Madrid Castilla and then to not get signed by anyone I know it happens anyone. but it, but it still blows my mind because or you'd have to move way further down than you were expecting in the league structure you know yeah yeah like, it blows my mind because you you watch some of those U23 teams play and you're like well these guys are pretty good but then do you see uh Wake good. Forest went over to England and they were playing like the Norwich U23s and they played um somebody and they beat I didn't all see of them that, actually that's cool I think it was last summer they they played oh who was it I don't remember. They went on like a tour of England and played a bunch of U23 teams and they beat all of them like 5-0. Yeah. Like they smashed them. Wake Forest did. And Wake Forest is a super good team, probably filled with internationals. But point being is the best Division One schools aren't that far away. No. And, and so why... And another thing with that, you got to think in those... The guys that are, if they ha- if those clubs th- that those guys are at, those U23 squads, if they're a top U23 player, they're in the first team. So that's not the club's best players of those age group anyway. That's, really, that's, you know? that's true, too. Because if you look at, like, Manchester City, technically they could have Holland. Good enough, and, you're old enough, right? Yeah, technically they could have Holland and Foden in their U23 team right now, and it's like they would kill everybody. Yeah. Um, look at Arsenal. Yeah. Well, their entire first team is, is U23, basically. Pretty young you know team, yeah. uh, I don't know how old Ramsdale is, but Saliba. He's uh, like 21, 22. Yeah, yeah. Saliba, Saliba could go. Uh, Martinelli, Saka. Odegaard. Uh, yeah. No, Odegaard's a bit older, no? Is he like 25? He might be a little older. I thought yeah, he was 22, but, 23. And Kedia, like, they could have Fabio Vieira. Like, like half their team yeah. could go into a U23 team. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Still, though. But at the same time, those guys, it's like back in, I think if you ran the clock back 10 years, that maybe wouldn't have happened. Maybe, maybe more than 10 years. Like my dad was a division one college coach for like 13 years uh, at University of Hartford, which is like, I mean, it's like probably below a mid major. Um, I think at this point, they've actually, they're actually transitioning to D3, which is surprising to me. But, um, when he was there, he had them competitive and like they went to the national tournament like three times. One time they went to the Elite Eight, which was a probably an overachievement for that team. But uh like at that point, I don't think if he brought that team to you play U twenty threes, I don't know how that would have gone. No, probably I don't not know. I'm thinking well. I'm thinking about that team because that team is very similar to what I'm saying. It's like a lot of those guys, like he had like five Swedes. Like, he had guys that were like starting for Malmo under 21s or under 18s or whatever, and then wasn't quite quick enough or whatever to go play for the first team, but he's good enough to come to the U.S. and get a full ride, you know? Yeah. Uh, and he had a lot of guys like that. So it was like, maybe actually you bring that team and play some U23s, maybe they yeah, are going to be. Who know? knows? It's, yeah, it's so weird. That's the thing. It's so weird because it's, it's luck or an injury. You've got yeah. like a – you're a right back and then all of a sudden the first team right back is injured and you're in the team and you play well and all of a sudden you're in and you've you've, 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 you've got minutes out. yeah yeah exactly and then you're playing until either on depending on who the starter is like if the starter's Kyle Walker then he's going straight back into the team but but to that point you've you've played enough games by that point that even if you don't stay there you're getting a move somewhere yeah so yeah. you'll be able to go somewhere but the, the problem with those guys is it becomes like yeah they're they, they're good, good enough to play for a full professional team even, which in England you just have to be in the top five divisions to be full pro. I think in Sweden, four. four yeah, four. Yeah, you're right. The fifth year is the one that's like not. but That's Rex. Um, <laughs> yeah, but in Sweden it, it was like the top four. So it's like it may have changed now that it's the top three, but it's like even those leagues that aren't full pro, they're semi-pro. So it's like you're getting guys that are getting a contract. Um and it's like, but at a certain point, if you get released and you don't, you don't maybe have skills for another job and you got to go down the league, that's all of a sudden you're not making enough money to really have that be your living. But that's yeah. what the plan was. So it's like, it's tough. That's what, you know? that's what I told guys when we went to Mexico, the young, the young ones. Because I went, I went just to experience it. I was not expecting anyone to, I was, I was 24, 25. Yeah. I, no, I, I wasn't there to go play there. I was there to play in some games, have some fun, see Mexico, like see what it's like, blah, blah, blah. We got 18, 19-year-olds going with us, some of whom you know. 
And I'm like, you guys have to be them, right. I'm like, you guys have to be ready because these guys are not going to want some American kid to take their spot if they have a family. And first game, a bunch of hard tackles come in real early, and people were rattled. And I was like, guys, relax. It's okay. Yeah. Like you're here to take their jobs. This is not the same. Yeah, like, they're not too they, happy about you being here. No, they don't. They don't get to go back to the U.S. and hang out at their parents' house. Like it's different. It's different. You may here. have a, a slightly different standard of life as well. You know. Yeah. Um, then we adjusted. We lost all five games we played, but it was all it was two one three two two one three two and three two. So yeah, they were all competitive. Um, but I think that, that was weird. What you just said about that being ready, being prepared, like that would be the main thing that I would tell any like young player. And it's like you can relate that to like even with me. It's like. I, who the, who would ever I, there's no way you could have ever foreseen that i would have got uh i didn't even know these swedish guys were coming to visit my school you know what i mean like they just showed up and like i happen to be ready and it's like if you get offered a trial you better take it because no, you're not you going to get that offer again if you turn it down probably so like it's be ready to do it be ready physically when you get there be mentally mentally is probably the hardest part oh it has uh, to be for, especially for a good player but uh, yeah don't get be. rattled by those hard challenges. Don't get rattled by a guy taking you on if you're an outside back. That's what's supposed to happen, you know? Yeah. That was that was fun for me because I was playing outside back and some six. And so I was following. Yeah. In Mexico, they play heavy through the tens. Mm -hmm. And so I was following. And those wingers are trying to square yeah. you up all the time. Yeah. Always. Always. I got my first involvement in the first game. A dude tried to spin me and I put a shoulder into him and sent him to the turret, like to the grass and the ref called a foul. It wasn't a foul. So fit easy, like 50, 50 shoulder to shoulder. But I was, I was so, I was so ready physically. I yeah. ran, I ran through him and the refs also didn't give us any calls when we were there either. So that wasn't, that wasn't helpful. But yeah. right after we came back from that, Jenna, Jenna and I were talking about um, the, the people that helped us get over there were talking to me about, oh, do you want to maybe go here or there? And I was kind of like, nah. Because at that point, I had the job and like, a, I used Tulsa as the example. Tulsa was never, nobody ever asked me about Tulsa, but I'm like, I'm not moving to Tulsa to make $20,000 a year. Sorry. Like, it's just not, it's not going to happen. Over there? Yeah. And I just used it because Matt Sheldon was playing for them at the time and he runs that Become Elite uh, YouTube channel. So it's an easy example. I have no, nothing against Tulsa at all. I feel like I yeah. need to keep saying that because I've used them as the example the last six times I've said it. Well, the only place you can get by with 20 grand a year it might be Tulsa, to be honest. But yeah. well, that's, that's true. <laughs> um, I but, can only say that I used to, I, I lived around, uh, you know, Arkansas for like 10 years. So I've been around yeah. a little bit, but yeah. But she was like, what do you mean? Like if they called you tomorrow, you'd have to be ready to go. I was like, yeah, that's how it works. Cause if I don't do it, they'll get some 18 year old sitting on the couch who wants, who's like been ready for it. And it's like, yeah, she was like, this is exactly that. Something... I was like, no, yes, they can. And they will. Yeah. This is exactly something that happened with me with the, the team in the same division where, um, it's now Phoenix Rising. It used to be Arizona uh, United, mm -hmm. yeah, I yeah. think. Or it's the other way around, maybe. Yeah, but yeah it was Phoenix like Rising I, got now. A call, I got a call from somebody who I just happen to know on the on their coaching staff, and it was like, we're going to give you a three-day trial, but you've got to get here like in five days. or like It was like that level of notice. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, you better be ready. Yeah, uh, That one didn't work out, but it's like, yeah, you just that's the, exactly what you were just saying, you know. Yeah, because if you don't, if you say no, they'll just call somebody else. They've, yeah, or call someone else who's probably already played at that level, you know. Yeah, or they've got some kid in the academy that they don't have to pay and they don't have to worry about housing and passports and paperwork and all the rest of the stuff. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, it's after dipping my toes into it, I was like, yeah. Safe. Yeah. I'll I'll stay here because and and the other oh. story that I tell is um a friend of mine that I met at um at the at a Loudon United preseason thing. He lives in Delaware, and there's the leagues there are not like they are here. And so for him, he's been on trials with a bunch it's of he was on he was on trials with Bobcats and all this stuff because he doesn't have the luxury of saying, hey, you know, I'm going to play for a Virginia Dream, which is borderline at the level, anyways. 
mm-hmm. like maybe USL two for sure, maybe Nissa yeah. USL one type, like borderline at that level. If we had a real coach and we're maybe a little bit more in shape, sharper, it's like I have the luxury to say, "Nah, I'll stay here and play twenty minutes away from where I live at a high level." And that's something that I think we're very lucky that we have that here. Yeah, for sure. That's yeah. That's something I. I mean, I grew up in New England. There's pretty good. I mean, I was there when I was like solely a youth player for like high school and club. So it's like obviously that's there's more around for that at that age group. But yeah, when I was in Arkansas, the the adult amateur stuff is just like not. I mean, there's good. Don't get me wrong. There are good players down there, but like a lot of them you know, if they're college guys, they're not from there, they move out, like, you know, it's just not anywhere near the level that the amateur league is Yeah, around here. I mean, in Northern Virginia, DC area, for sure. Yeah. There's so many teams and so many players. Uh, All right. We got places to go shortly. So I feel like this is a good place, good place to wrap it up. Oh, wait, you don't want to talk about Dortmund? Well, we can talk about Dortmund if you talk about We don't Arsenal. have to. Don't worry. Yeah. I mean, we, we can just maybe skip this part. Yeah. Arsenal no, no. is kind of a rough time, you know? Did, actually, I'll say this. Did you watch – you probably didn't watch the highlights of the game. I'll show you later. Of the Dortmund today, game no, today. I didn't. There is – ball comes across from the left. Adeyemi is going across to the right, and he goes to shield the ball – and the left back who's following him leaves his feet, two foot tackles him from behind, gets nowhere near the ball in the box, and the ref is like, no. I don't understand. You know, you're in the Bundesliga. Those refs know who's on top. You know, Bayern, FC hey, Hollywood. A- apparently, that's true. You know what's funny is nobody knows why they're called FC Hollywood unless you really pay attention to the league. And, like, if you really pay attention to the league, then it makes total sense. They had a bust up in training yesterday. Byron did. Thomas Tuchel broke one of the slalom poles over his knee, and Sane was yelling at somebody else, and like it was, it was a whole thing. So I'm hoping they drop points again because they've given us so. We have there's three games for us this year: the Werder Bremen game where we were up two zero in the 90th minute, and we lost three two. The Stuttgart game where we were Stuttgart up two zero, two zero with a man up, and then they came <laughs> back to tie. Then we scored in the 93rd minute to go up three two, and we still blew that one. And then today, and yeah. if if we take that's two out of nine points. So if you give us those, even just we'll say we win one of them and draw the other one, like that's an extra four points. And we'd be right now six points clear with four mm-hmm. games to go instead of two points clear and Byron yeah. has a game in hand. And it's like those, it's like those little things. And I, as soon as that game, the Verter Bremen game happened um, at the beginning of the season, I was like, guys what are we doing what yeah i think what you just said super applies to arsenal over the past month or so uh it's been rough since saliba went out i don't think we've matched since he got hurt actually um maybe we have but if we have it's only been like one you guys were Uh, still unbeaten for a while which was the crazy part you guys were just were drawing instead of winning yeah but even if you if you look at that it's like we had that four game stretch. It's Liverpool, West Ham, both those away. Southampton at home. The West Ham, the West Ham, the West Ham and the Southampton ones are the ones that I'd be irritated with. Liverpool going into that game, if you told me at the if you told me you'd go away to Anfield and get a point, I'd be like, if I was you guys, I'd be like, Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. It's like you have you have twelve, you have twelve available points and you take three points. Three, yeah. So I would at that point, it's it's like trade off, lose away to Liverpool, lose away to City, and take six points there instead yep. of three. Yeah, so, you know, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. After the after the game, after the door we gave today, I was just sulking. I was like, oh, yeah. I need to record this podcast. Sorry, Ian, uh, I'll be a few minutes late. <laughs> yeah, yep. Uh, the past couple of days have been rough since that City result with Arsenal. Uh, getting absolutely trashed in the group chats. I'm sure that's so harsh, though. I think from you guys, like from from it's a positive season. Yeah, I saw somebody say that you guys were just having a Brendan Rodgers 2013, 2014 with season with Liverpool, and I was like, yeah. eh. They're, they're like, yeah, Arteta's gonna get sacked within two seasons because they're not gonna. Ha- they're like, they're gonna fall back down and they're gonna finish in sixth next year or something. And I was we'll like, see. I don't know, because I was like, Chelsea's our team's a lot better. Right. That's right. But 
all your players are su- supposed to get better, you will have had a full season to integrate Trossard in. Saliba mm-hmm. will be back. I assume that you're going to go buy a, a center back, another center back. I think we're buying. I'm I'm assuming that we're buying in every line, honestly. Yeah. We won't I mean, be able to bring in top guys now. Yeah. Has that Polish guy played a game for you? That left he's played a couple. Back? He's, come, he he's played a couple. How's he looked? Um, he's looked a little shaky, to be honest with you. He's look he's he's physically like got everything, I think. Um uh-huh. he's young. I don't think he was quite ready. Um he got thrust into it against Sporting, I think, when because uh, we had Tamiyasu already out. Oh, and then, I forgot about uh, him. Yeah, that's a that's another big one. We lost Tommy Austin and then Saliba within like a couple weeks. For so like let me ask season. you this: Do you think you guys will buy a right back and then move Ben White back into the middle? I think we should just to have more options at right back. I think Ben White's super good going forward. Um, he might be better defensively as a center back. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I like having Tommy Austin, him, and then another maybe out and out kind of wing back like traditional kind of like yeah um i like what we have on the left with tierney and zinchenko i think maybe maybe tierney should start to be honest but i don't know i don't I, well i actually i disagree with that part of me is i was saying this to somebody the other day i think zinchenko is your best player best footballer eh, i don't know about that but like or one of them right you can i think he's got Odin. super i mean there's no doubt he's like technically obviously great he's a center mid for ukraine he's like captain of their team he's got yeah. ridiculous leadership like qualities um i just think defensively and offensively tyranny is better like he gets more goals and assists and i think he's a better on-on defender and it's like when you look at what happened this, against liverpool yeah he got, zinchenko got burned pretty bad for that he did for that he's he, no one no one's out there saying he's the best one-on-one defender ever no but i don't think you can say that either let but. me ask you this then i wonder why arteta didn't try after holding had a couple near games why he didn't move put zinchenko at right back as the inverted fullback and put ben white as center back with gabriel and start tyranny on the left i mean i think it might just be as simple as like he's never really played there before and he's very left footed, honestly. Um, I don't know if that's the answer, but like, well, he plays in midfield basically. He does. Anyways. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I would assume that's something that, that they would have talked about. I feel like they have enough good brains in there to have thought through yeah. that one. I don't know. It's interesting. And yeah, for us, like for Dortmund, it's just, Oh, it's like, we have no, we don't have like, God bless Hilaire, man. He came back from cancer. Good for him. He scored no goals for us, basically. <laughs> and Modest is – Modest, we only signed him because Hilaire got cancer. And then Mukoko is like 17. And that, yeah. those are our strikers. Malin has scored six goals in his last six games, and he scored seven goals all season. So we don't have him. Adeyemi is super young. Royce is always injured, and Brandt has been playing kind of well. But we don't have. He's really more of a winger, though. Yeah, but we don't have like. We don't have Holland anymore. Well, I mean, well, obviously, but even before we had Aubameyang, or we had that season with Batshuayi, who was scoring a lot, or Paco Lewandowski Alter, before that. Lewandowski, but we even we even without them, we had Batshuayi, who scored like twenty goals, and Alcacer, who was with us for two seasons, he yeah. he scored like twenty goals, and neither of them are top top strikers, but. Like Alcacer went back to Villarreal and did nothing, and Batshuayi is in Turkey now. But they yeah. both bagged goals for us. It's like really like we just need like Allaire can't move, and it's when I watch, I'm like, oh, yeah. He's and then more they're like, a... oh, we'll sub Modest on. It's like no, <laughs> it's like, yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We don't play to. We don't swing balls into the box, which is what they do. I don't even know why we signed Alaire in the first place. I'm not gonna lie. You need to be swinging balls into the box for him. He's very well, good in the air. But that's what I'm saying. We don't. If you're gonna play, have him, we don't play that way. But I don't know why we signed him in the first place. Like yeah, we spent a great season at Ajax last year. I guess maybe that's why. But yes, but he doesn't fit. It's like why would you? Why would in the recruiting department? We're, we've been so good with the recruiting of young players, right? Sancho, Bellingham. Uh, Usmane Dembele, 
Aubameyang. Yeah. We um like all like all the Lewandowski we took from some Polish oh, club yeah. like Holland. Well, Holland everybody knew was going to be that was like a one that was like a two season cameo before he was going to go somewhere else. But the other ones we all like even Bino Gittens to some extent or. I don't know. Mm. It's like, it's like, wh- where was the striker? We, like, we didn't even need to get. We just needed to get somebody a bit more mobile. Like, if in my head, if we had grabbed, I'm trying not to think of prim- Premier League strikers because their their wages are too high. But even like a like an Ollie Watkins type, he's like good he player. He, right, he doesn't even have to be a world beater, dude. Like, he doesn't get into the England team. He would bag <laughs> goals for us. So yeah, I don't know. It's would. weird. It's weird. I, I'm gonna actually. I won't do this now while we're recording, but I'm gonna find one. It's just I like I I oh, I don't know. I'm I play with them in Football Manager, and I basically just fast forwarded until Mukoko was an elite player, <laughs> and now he's scoring forty goals a season. <laughs> but yeah. it's like, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Ah, uh, good times. Good it's times. Just, good times. Maybe next year for Arsenal, we'll see. Mm, yeah, I mean, City will go spend another two hundred million, and then yeah, you guys will be. Uh... This was the year for both of us. This was the year to do it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I got. I got to. I got to keep the. I got to keep something going to stay sane with it. You know. Yeah, that's true. You guys are still what five points clear. I think we're. Uh... Three points clear. Three points clear. What with two games? They, yeah, in hand? two games. They have two games in hand on us. Yeah. Mm. Maybe they'll Not lose. Looking great. Maybe they'll lose. They might lose. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, maybe maybe they'll go kill Madrid and then party. Or maybe they'll lose to Madrid and they'll throw them off. Ooh. I, see, look at that. Those are two great options, and either one yeah. will happen. They're either going to yeah. win or they're going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> They're winning or losing, that's for sure, you know. That's true. That's true. All right. We should wrap this up. Um All right. any last nickels? I got I got no change for you at the end, man. Sounds good. We'll see you guys next yeah. time. Peace. All right, take it easy.